Ron, thank you so much, and I'm happy to be here, Surface Navy Association, on your 25th anniversary of your symposium. Uh, I'll say a couple of things about that introduction. One is, I was in the Navy so long ago, I wasn't a SWO. Uh, we didn't have designators at that point. Aviators had wings, uh, submariners had dolphins, uh, Surface Navy basically had black shoes, <laughs> which I was pretty proud of. Um, and Gordon Nagler was my captain, and like a lot of you who served as JOs with a captain, I, I kept in touch with him um, all his life. Uh, and uh, was very close to, to him. When I was sworn in as governor, he came. Uh, he came to the inaugural. And an enterprising reporter found him and said, well, did you see this potential in him when he was a junior officer on your ship? And Admiral Nagler said, well, I always thought he would amount to something. I just was pretty sure it wasn't going to be in the Navy. <laughs> So I'm really sorry he's not here. <laughs> uh, I want to thank y'all, members of this association, for all you have done and continue to do to demonstrate the diplomacy and the might of our nation through our surface Navy. You hear a lot about how complex the Navy is, about how big it is, about what uh, organizational challenge it is. Let me give you a few, few numbers. If the Department of the Navy was a private company, it would be the second largest in the world by employees. It would be the third largest in the world by assets. And it would be the fifth largest in the world by budget or revenue authority. It is truly a global, complex, complicated, and incredibly vital and necessary part of America and of our national defense. Now, one of the reasons I gave you that, those numbers, is those huge companies that the Navy keeps company with as as large entities and complex organizations. All of them operate from time to time with a degree of fiscal uncertainty. But nothing approaches the unknowns that Department of Navy and Department of Defense faces today. You've got a couple of things. One that gets a lot of the attention and a lot of the conversation is sequestration, as it should. It was delayed for two months, but it's still out there, still hanging over us. That would be a $4.6 billion hit for the Department of the Navy, should sequestration happen. And it would be a $4.6 billion hit five months into the year. So you'd have seven months to, to carry it out. Of equal concern, though, and it gets much less attention, is the continuing resolution. We are operating under the FY12 budget, under a continuing resolution. That expires at the end of March. If that is continued, if that continuing resolution is extended for the rest of the fiscal year, that's another exactly the same number, $4.6 billion hit to the Navy. And the, the issue beside the, the size is the mindless way both of those things operate. Sequestration, you just whack a certain percentage off of virtually every program. Continuing resolution says you stay at the levels you were last year and no new starts. 
So <clears throat> both of these things pose big risk for the Department of the Navy. And nobody likes budget cuts, but if defense or Navy has to be a part of some going forward grand bargain or strategy or deal, then give us the top line. Let us manage how any cuts, how any reductions are made. Let us put dollars against strategy instead of simply cutting the top line. And one of those things that I think is incredibly important, and I'm going to talk about some, is making sure we maintain our shipbuilding programs that we have going. Making sure that we can meet the new defense strategy that the President laid out uh, a year ago this month. We have shown, I believe pretty decisively so, that we know how to manage the budget. That we know how to set some priorities, that we know how to get money into programs, that we know how to drive a hard bargain, that we know how to get the most money for the taxpayer's dollar. Instead of mindlessly cutting, give us that chance to manage to whatever the final number is, but not do it in a simply automatic way across programs, across, across the department. We've taken some actions, it's got a lot of attention about trying to, today, slow the burn rate. Slow the rate that we're spending money so that should either or both of these occur, we won't have to make all the reductions in the very compressed period of time that we would have to. We're trying to make those as reversible as possible, trying to make sure that whatever we do today, if the issues are solved, if a budget is passed, if sequestration is not triggered, that we have not done irreparable, something irreparable to a program or to the entire department. But these fiscal challenges are serious. These fiscal challenges have to be addressed in some way, but if, regardless of what the fiscal challenges are, let's make sure that we put the money that is allocated for the Navy and for defense into some priorities and not just slice programs, as I said, fairly mindlessly the way that these two issues would do today. So I started off this talk on a fairly down note. But in the, <clears throat> in the sense of, you know, remember the old joke, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Absent these budget things that are hanging over us, the Navy and Marine Corps are in good shape. We will, we are and we will continue to be, regardless of what happens. We will continue to be the finest and most formidable expeditionary fighting force the world has ever known. And I think it's because of some of the actions we have taken, some of the actions that we have taken in various fields. And in this city of acronyms and abbreviations, and I work in a building, and a lot of you do, full of acronyms and abbreviations, 
I've come up with one for sort of organizing how the Navy, the Department of the Navy, has approached issues that we have. And it's the four Ps, people, platforms, power, and partnerships. And these are all interrelated. You've got to have enough platforms of the right type, but you've also got to have enough people with the right training to run them. If we don't have the energy mix right, the power right, we may have to park. We have to pull some of these ships and leave them next to the pier. We have to ground some of our aircraft. We've got to have that, that right and to build the partnerships that we need to do that are an integral part of the new defense strategy, we have to have enough gray hulls on the horizon to go and build these partnerships. Now, this new strategy requires that each one of these be done well. It's a maritime strategy, focusing on the Western Pacific, the Arabian Gulf, and on building partnerships around the world using innovative, low-cost, small footprint methods. That's a definition of the United States Navy and Marine Corps. So let me take you through those four very quickly. Top priority of mine and of the Navy's continues to be our people. Take care of the sailors and Marines. Continue to be the best by taking care of the best. And I don't have to convince people in this room how skilled, how talented, how dedicated the people that make up the United States Navy and Marine Corps are. The level of dedication is simply astounding. Very different Navy from the one that you and I started out in. I served with some amazingly good people, very dedicated, very skilled. We couldn't touch the force we have today with the level of talent. And unlike any other military in the world, and unlike most other organizations, we push responsibility down. We push it down in terms of rank. We push it down in terms of age. It's pretty astonishing, the responsibility that we expect from our youngest sailors, our most junior Marines. And we do it day in and day out, and we get the type of response that we anticipate. But in the last more than a decade now, we've been involved in two wars. We've had an incredibly high operational tempo, and it's put a lot of stress on this force and on the families of this force. And so we need to worry about the health of the force. And you see a lot of, and again, rightfully so, you see a lot of discussion about things like sexual assault, suicide, about things like the sacrifices families are making, about the readiness of the force, about how physically fit they are. And one of the things that we did was when we looked at these issues, we found that we had some pretty good programs going. We're beginning to find some answers on things like how to prevent sexual assault, but we also found that they were pretty stovepiped, that one program didn't talk to the other. And so we put them all together in something called 21st Century Sailor and Marine that I announced last spring. And what this tries to do is bring every program designed for sailors, Marines, or their families in one place. And it, there's a website, 21st Century Sailor and Marine, that is obviously getting some attention because of the number of hits that it's getting. But while we were trying to put together a one-stop place for sailors and their families to go to, we began to learn some things. For example, in nearly all cases of suicide, 
sexual assault, domestic violence. There was one common denominator, and that was alcohol. Nearly every time. And so now we're, we're doing some programs on alcohol. We're doing education, try to deglamorize some of the uses of alcohol, but we're also, for duty stations coming on, we're doing breathalyzers. And they're non-punitive, but if you pop positive seven or eight hours after the Super Bowl, when you show up to work at seven o'clock in the morning, and you do that a couple of times, we're gonna get you into something to help you. Because what you don't want is a career altering or career ending or life altering or life ending incident. What you're trying to do is keep the force healthy. What you're trying to do is keep the force fit. And these things go all the way from the suicide prevention to what sailors eat, how we how we do a culture of fitness instead of just getting ready for the PFT on the wellness in every possible way of the force. For the military to best serve our nation, it also has got to be reflective of the nation that we serve. And we are doing a lot in terms of diversity and inclusion and we're moving toward ending the final barriers where women may serve, including, on my watch, in submarines. We want to connect with different kinds of places to get officers. So we have brought back, after 40 years, in our OTC at Harvard, at Yale, at Columbia. We've added it at Rutgers and at Arizona State. Nobody should be denied the honor of defending this country. And that's one of the things we're trying to reach out and do. And when men and women leave the military, whether it's after four years or 40, I think we've got a big obligation to help make that sometimes not easy transition in the civilian world to work on things like employment and particularly for our wounded warriors. And one of the things we're doing in Navy, out of all the things we're doing in these transition programs, is we're hiring wounded warriors directly into Navy. They have a lot of the skills that we need. We had a goal last year of hiring at least one wounded warrior a day for a year. We tripled that. We hired 1,000 wounded warriors into Navy. Uh, and that's a good deal for everybody because they do bring amazing resilience and amazing skills. Second P is platforms. And I know that y'all have heard a lot about this, and I know that you're going to hear some more. The under is going to talk about it uh, in, in, when he talks to you later on today. And I think we have made some pretty remarkable strides in shipbuilding. In 2001, on 9-11, 2001, the United States Navy had 316 ships in the battle fleet. We had 277,000 sailors, 377,000 sailors. By 2008, during one of the great military buildups in American history, the United States Navy was at 278 ships. And we had gone down by 49,000 sailors. In 2008, we built three ships. That's nowhere close to enough to offset retirements. When I came in in 2009, a lot of our shipbuilding programs were, and this is a technical term, a mess. 
ships were being designed while they were being built. There was requirements got out of control. Cost on too many got out of control. And I'll give you a couple of examples. When I came in, the LCS, the two variants, we had one in the water from each variant and one being built. We bid out three more the, about a month after I got there. And the bids came in unsustainably high. We just couldn't afford it. We needed the ship, but we couldn't afford it. So while we wanted both variants, while they each brought something unique, they both met the core missions. So I made the decision to pull back the RFP to put it back out and say, okay, we're gonna do, we're, we're gonna pick one variant and you're gonna compete against each other based mainly on price. And the winner will get 10 ships over five years. The winner will also have to give us a technical package so that we bid it out to a second yard to keep competition going. And the second yard will get nine ships over that same five years. So over the course of the next year, during the negotiations, the prices came down by around 40%. And I still don't know who won. I purposely didn't want to know. But when it was clear that the cost had come down so far and when it was also clear that both shipyards were willing to sign firm fixed price contracts and block buys, I went back to Congress and said, can we buy both versions again? Got approval, even though it was Going back and asking for that permission went against a lot of advice that just wasn't gonna happen. But we were allowed to do that. So we got 20 ships, 10 from each vendor, instead of 19, and we saved $2.9 billion on the program. And the 10th ship that's being built of that class will be substantially cheaper than the first of those 10 ships in that five year period. There's a learning curve. On DDG 51, which the line was restarted because one of the things that Tom Copeland, head of surface warfare, said, yeah, said the day before yesterday, we need to build the hulls we know how to build. When it got restarted, we've got, as all of y'all know, two shipyards that build them. Bath in Maine, Pascagoula in Mississippi. And you want more than one shipyard building every type of ship possible. But there wasn't really a competition going on. There was more of an allocation. Bath, you get one. Pascagoula, you get one. So we bid out three ships. And we said, Bath, you're gonna get one of those ships, and Pascagoula, you're gonna get one of those ships, but the low bid gets the third ship. And oh, by the way, the difference between the low bid and the high bid comes out of the high bidder's fee. We got those three DDG-51s and saved almost $300 million from the original estimate. We're trying to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. We're trying to work with industry. Industry has the right to make a fair return on these ships. And we owe industry some things. Again, borrowing from Tom Coburn, we owe industry a stable design. And that's where we are. We owe industry mature technology, and that's where we are. If we get something new and gee whiz, it's just gonna have to go on the next block. And third, we owe industry some transparency. 
how many ships we're going to build, what types of ships are we going to build. And I think we've done that. In return, industry owes us some stuff. If they've got that transparency, industry owes us making the investments in the workforce, training, and in infrastructure so that there will be a learning curve as we build these ships. Industry owes us every, every ship of the same type without major design changes ought to cost less than the one that went before it. So today, 2008 we built three ships. Today we have 42 ships under contract. 42. Most of them, virtually all of them. Firm fixed price contracts, a lot of them under multi years. And the DDG 51 program, that program office was selected for the 2012 David Packard Excellence in Acquisition Award because of some of the things that were, hap that were happening. There are still some issues, some of them historic, but we're working on every one of them. And I think that given the number of ships we've got under contract, and given the fact that we've gone now to a fleet of 288 ships today, and we will be at 300 and beyond before the end of the decade. And if you look at our 30-year shipbuilding plan out to the future, we'll sustain those, those numbers that we're getting the ships that we need, we're getting the right mix that we need, we're getting the numbers that we need, because quantity at some point begins to have a quality all its own. I'm proud of where we are on shipbuilding. The third of these four, power, talks about, as Ron said, the energy goals that I set. I set those in the fall of 2009. The biggest one said that by no later than 2020, at least half of all naval energy, both float and ashore, would come from non-fossil fuel sources. And we did it to make us better warfighters. We did it to reduce our military vulnerability. We did it to make sure that we can fulfill our military missions. We're doing it not only through moving toward alternative energy, but also through some efficiencies. And I can give you example after example after example. On the ground in Afghanistan, during some of the heaviest fighting there in Sangin, Marines reduced their power consumption overall by 25%. India Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Lightened their load just by using solar chargers, solar blankets you could roll up, stick in your pack. A company dropped 700 pounds of batteries by doing that. Not only did they not have to hump that 700 pounds, they didn't have to be resupplied, which also cut down on the risk. Less fuel ultimately means fewer convoys, fewer Marines put at risk. We had SEAL teams just coming out of the field now that tested things to make them net zero in energy and water. So they don't have to be resupplied at all. They can stay in the field, which makes them far better in terms of time on mission, in terms of independence of action and movement. U.S. military is the largest single consumer of fossil fuels in the world. 
And every time the price of a barrel of oil goes up a dollar, every time, it costs the Navy $30 million in additional fuel cost. Now, if you want to put that into some surface terms, that's 142 steaming days for all our LHDs, 293 days for, our for steaming and combat ops of an Arleigh Burke destroyer. So if, you know, even if we could get all the oil and gas we needed inside the U.S., it is still the ultimate global commodity. The price is set globally. Some hardliner threatens to close the Straits of Hormuz and the price is going to spike. When Libya happened a couple of years ago, the price went up $40 a barrel almost overnight. That's a billion dollar bill to us. In FY12 alone, toward the end of the year, we were presented in Navy a $500 million additional fuel cost bill. And it was simply because a year and a half earlier when the budget was put in, nobody could estimate accurately what the price was going to be. Well now, in 12, we were able to solve that thanks to some help from Secretary of Defense's office by using some OCO funds. OCO's not going to be there or not in these numbers and not available for this kind of use forever. If I get presented on behalf of the Navy with another $500 million or greater bill, there are really only two places to go for it. One is operations and maintenance. And again, borrowing from Tom Copeman, we don't need to steam less, fly less, train less. The other place, if the bill gets too big, is to begin to cut platforms. I don't want to do either one of those things. And I don't think we have to. If we've got a more stable source of energy being produced inside the U.S. that we can budget for and plan for and that doesn't respond to some of these international crises, we are better war fighters. We demonstrated last summer at RIMPAC the Great Green Fleet. Carrier Strike Group, Carrier obviously was nuclear, but every type of aircraft that flew off that carrier flew on a mix of avgas and biofuels. Every single surface ship steamed on a mixture of regular fuel and biofuels. And the big news out of that, the big news, nothing happened. We bought this, these biofuels, put them in the normal logistics chain, put them on an oiler, which may be misnamed now, in Hawaii, and sent them out. Not a single engine had to be changed. Not a single setting had to be changed. The engines didn't notice the difference. We fired <coughs> every type of aircraft off catapults, off the Nimitz during the Great Green Fleet. We did every sort of helicopter that we've got and nothing happened. We did the first air-to-air -air refueling using biofuels. There were a lot of firsts that day. And a lot of our global partners, some of whom are here today, are participating. The Australians, who were making a big effort in biofuels, landed one of their helicopters on Nimitz, refueled, and took back off to go back to the Australian ship. We've got 
countries around the world. Brazil, Singapore, Italy, others pursuing biofuels as an alternative. But it's not just that. It's also some efficiencies that we're doing. Make an island, hybrid ship, it's got an electric drive, speeds under 12 knots. We deployed Make an Island with a $33 million fuel budget. It spent $15 million of that $33 million. We were able to plow the $18 million that it saved back into O&M. So the next two ships, the America and the Triple E, LHAs that are coming, we're going to have this electric drive. We're looking at retrofitting some of our DDGs with this. We are doing things that don't get much attention. Stern flaps, changing the lighting on ships, different hull coatings. And for doing that, Macon Island and five other surface combatants got the Navy Energy Award for saving 111,000 barrels of oil in fiscal year 11. We simply have to do that. We've got to make this move. We have to. We don't have any choice. And we're beginning to see, in just pure financial terms, some real returns on the energy investments we've made only two or three years before, and you're going to see them throughout the FIDUP and beyond. And lastly, fourth P, partnership. Now, I make it a point of trying to go and visit as many sailors and Marines as I can around the world, see them deployed, to be with them where they're actually doing the work, where Navy and Marine Corps, my description is we're America's away team. When we're doing our job, most of the time we're a long way from home, and America really doesn't know what we're doing or how good the fleet is, how good those sailors and Marines are of doing. I have been, for example, to Afghanistan 10 different times to express the appreciation, the gratitude of this nation for the sacrifices that the sailors and Marines are making there. But I've also gone to 96 countries around the world. And I've traveled 670,000 air miles. I am permanently jet lagged. I do it to meet sailors and Marines, but I also do it to go into these countries that we operate with, that we partner with, that we are trying to build their capacity. Because the new defense strategy says that it has three parts. One is focus on the Western Pacific. Two is focus on the Arabian Gulf. And three is build partnerships, build capacity around the world. I go to the Pacific to talk about this new strategy and to say that it is real. Look at what we're doing with the Marines in Australia, with Marines in Guam. Look at what we're doing putting four LCSs in Singapore. Look at what we're doing in terms of where the new bills are going into the Pacific. Also visit Europe, though. Talk about the fact that NATO remains our bedrock alliance. That NATO, for decades, has been that alliance and will continue to be. And that not only is naval presence not shrinking in NATO, it is increasing. We're moving four destroyers to row to Spain to do ballistic missile defense work. Our commitment to these partnerships is real, it is substantive, and it is lasting, and our presence all around Europe, from Rota to Italy to 
Greece to Spain, working with our allies, Great Britain is real, it's substantive, it's important. And this new defense strategy does not diminish that importance. In fact, it increases it. Back here at home, I think one of my main jobs, and I hope one of your main jobs, is to talk to the 99% of the American people who do not serve in uniform, many of whom have no connection to our military. Talk about the importance of the fleet. Talk about the importance of what the Navy and Marine Corps team is doing around the world, and talk about how good those sailors and Marines are, how dedicated they are, how many sacrifices they and their families make, how the operational tempo has been so high, how they have answered every time. So finally, in keeping with your conference, the Navy and Marine Corps, America's away team, stands ready to answer every bell. Semper Fortis. Probably nobody's got a question, but just in case. Not to disappoint you, <laughs> Secretary Otto. Frazier. I was being a little facetious there. <laughs> uh, sea Power magazine, uh, you gave a, a fairly positive view. You thought the Navy and Marine Corps were doing well. Uh, yesterday we heard uh, uh, some more gloomier news. Admiral Gortney particularly uh, thought that the, the Navy was with them, with very close to dropping off the edge as far as uh, readiness going hollow, number of things, budget problems, and, and that sort of thing. You know, I mean, you, you, know, say you, you're, you were very positive, but how do you address what Admiral uh, Gortney was saying about our, our closeness? Well, I, I think he's right, particularly with the budget situation. Um, and it's part of what I was talking about, uh, about the mindless way these cuts operate. Um, if give, give us the authority, give us the flexibility, give us the ability to, man, to manage whatever budget is coming. Um, we, we will have to make some hard choices, but one of those choices that we may not have to make is readiness. But if the if sequestration and the CR, if the CR continues and sequestration is triggered, we don't have any, we don't have that choice. We don't have the choice of how to how to move money, of how to, of what what's our priority. If our priority is training, if our priority is shipbuilding, if our priority is readiness, if our priority is making sure that that when we send ships to sea, they're ready to go to sea. If our priority is building ships to get to the, to the size that we need, give us the ability to put money against those priorities and not just say, cut, cut, cut. So I, I agree with Admiral Gortney that if these things are triggered uh, and the sort of automatic, mindless way they work, um, you do run a big risk of becoming hollow. Um, if they're not, uh, if, if we're given the ability to manage, then I do think we're in, we're in good shape. And I do think we can set some priorities. And I do think we've demonstrated we can make some hard choices. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Um, my name is Mark Vandroff. I'm the DDG 51 program manager. I have a question that is possibly both selfish and that you may not want to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> um, sir, you and Secretary Work have been uh, tremendous, and you talked about it in your speech, you've both been tremendous advocates for shipbuilding within the Navy, um, which for a secretary in and under is not always been the case historically. Um, so I'll ask the question, with, uh, with the second term of the administration, uh, do you see yourself and Secretary Work um, 
sticking with the good fight and continuing to be advocates for shipbuilding here for the next few years as we continue on with uh, some of the initiatives you talked about in your uh, pitch, sir? Um, number one, as long as I'm here, I'm going to advocate for shipbuilding. Uh, number two, I'm going to be here as long as the president wants me to be here. Uh, I have maybe the best job in the world. And um, so uh, you get a chance in not very many minutes to ask Bob Work the same question. <laughs> I'll, I'll let him speak for himself. I won't presume to speak for, uh, for the under. But I will say, speaking of the under, not for the under, you couldn't have a better undersecretary than Bob Work. He, is, he has been tremendous not only in shipbuilding, but just across the board. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Michael Hoffman with Military.com. You spoke a little bit about sexual assault, and I wanted to focus specifically on the Naval Academy. Uh, there was a negative report that the Pentagon put forth about the increases seen at military uh, academies at large, citing 225 unspecified unspecified sexual contact at midshipmen reporting that at the Naval Academy. Now we have a Naval Academy instructor that's been charged with raping a midshipman. I'm wondering what um, type of attention you're placing towards this and what you think can be done to improve this situation at the Naval Academy. Okay. Number one, um, speaking more broadly, fleet-wide, one of the first things I did when I came in was I established the sexual assault prevention office that reports directly to me. You know, it's the only service that does that, but I consider that such a danger to, to the fleet, to our sailors, to our Marines. I wanted to know about it uh, personally. We are beginning fleet-wide to find answers to these things both in the Marine Corps and in the Navy. I mean, it is shameful that we have one of the, one sexual assault anywhere, but particularly in a military force, particularly in a military force, where we have, you know, when you take that oath, you are saying that you're willing to risk your life for your shipmate. Well, this is an attack on a shipmate. For the Naval Academy specifically, after I saw that report, uh, I went to the academy. I had the whole brigade there. I didn't ask any press because I just wanted to talk to the midshipmen. We have failed at the Naval Academy in terms of preventing this. In terms of reporting, number of reports went down. So there's something happening that's not right. And one of the things we're doing is there, there's a whole long list of concrete steps that the superintendent there is taking. The CNO was there with me when I went. So this is across the leadership of the Navy. But one of the things that we're going to do, we were treating the Naval Academy differently than we were the rest of the fleet. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to use best practices. The things that work in the fleet, we're bringing them in to the academy. We're doing things like putting more civilian sexual assault um, counselors, more security, um, but also some of the things that, some of the lessons that we have learned, some of the good results that we are getting, they're going to, they're going to go into the academy and they're going in there real fast. Um, because, I, as I said, right after that report came out, I'm not concerned about it. I'm mad about it. This shouldn't be happening. And the midshipmen can do better. They've got to do better, and they will do better in this. Yes? Sir, Sidney Friedberg from uh, AOL Defense. I'm looking at you know, the sequestration and CR issues. Uh, obviously, there are a number of measures you're you may have to take to fit under the sequester cap uh, that have already been lined up. 
if you are given that discretion to manage, to be t given a top line target, but not the straight line from 2012 or the straight cut across evenly, you know, you said you prioritize um, readiness, you said you prioritize shipbuilding, that kind of takes up a lot of the budget. So where, 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 what do you have to sacrifice to protect your priorities? Well, I think, well, number one, we are, in case these things, as I said, in case these things trigger, we're beginning to slow the burn rate down on programs now, on people now. Uh, but there are areas, and I think we've shown in the last four years that we're willing to make some pretty hard choices, that we're willing to cancel some stuff, that we're willing to, to do some things that are of lesser priority. I'm going to reserve the right to actually do that management. Um, if we get that thing without, um, I learned a long time ago, as Ron said, I've spent a lot of my life in elected politics, that I only get in trouble when I answer what if questions. Uh, but I will, I will just repeat what I said. Give us a flexibility. I think we've proven over the last four years, we've, we're building, we've got these 42 ships under contract with less money than they had in 2008, and they built three ships. Yes, ma'am. Sid Standifer with USNI. Um, to follow up on the sexual assault question, um, I was wondering, um, my understanding is that uh, as of right now, there is not a lot of very good metrics on what kind of training is actually effective at reducing sexual assault. Uh, do you think it's a wise use of resources for all the services, not just the Navy, um, to be putting resources into things like uh, bystander intervention and those kinds of programs without actually knowing which of the programs you're trying out now are effective? Well, the one thing I would say is I don't believe that that statement that you just made is true, that we don't know what is beginning to work. Um, we, we do know, and we are tracking these things pretty aggressively to make sure that what we're doing is working. Uh, and we, uh, I think every service faces a different situation. You know, thus far, we've not seen the situation like Lackland Air Force Base. Um, but one of the things that we discovered was that there were very small number of sexual assaults at Great Lakes in boot camp. But it went up dramatically when you went to A school. So, you know, number one, focus on A school. Bystander intervention seems to be the, one of the things that works the best. And part of it is because of what I said way earlier about alcohol. If you see somebody feeding somebody else drinks, you have got to do something about it. You just can't let that happen. You can't let it, you, if, one of the things I said to the midshipmen is, you know, if somebody came in here and was taking shots at mids, we'd take that really seriously. It's no less of an attack if, if somebody sexually assaults one of their shipmates. That's an attack. It's a crime. It's, it's criminal activity. And shipmates have the obligation to try to defend other shipmates. Bystander intervention programs, when they're done right, actually work. Are they, we're seeing evidence that they work. The Navy's got a program called No Zebras. And I had no clue as to what No Zebras meant, so I asked. 
It was named after the thing that if lions attack a herd of zebras, they call one zebra out from the herd and attack it, and the rest of the herd just moves off. If the herd stayed, they could beat the lions. Is to say, if you see somebody in a situation that may result in an assault, you've got an obligation to do something about it. It's not enough to say, lucky it's not me. It's not enough to say, I'm not involved here. You've got an obligation, it's your shipmate. It's your shipmate that may be under attack. You've got to step in. And so I do think putting resources into things like bystander intervention. I think it comes, one, from leadership, from people taking it very seriously at every level. Uh, and I, I think we're, we're pretty much there on that. I mean, Commandant of the Marine Corps and his um, Sergeant Major made a tour of virtually every Marine base just to talk about this, just to talk to their commanders about this. Um, number two, it's got to come from the deck plates. You've got to have your senior enlisted. You've got to have the chiefs, senior chiefs, master chiefs. They've got to be seriously invested in this. They've got to see this for what it is. It's a crime. It's not just something that happens. It's not just something that's a result of, you know, having mixed crews or something like that. It's a crime. Number three, shipmates have to look after other shipmates. As I said, we are very carefully and pretty aggressively tracking what works, what doesn't work, where we're seeing numbers go down. And for example, I'll give you one last example. In places where we have put breathalyzers in place, uh, for, in test programs, it's gone down. Um, that's one of the reasons we're doing that fleet wide, is it's not, it's not just sexual assault, but sexual assaults have gone down. So I cannot overstate how serious this is, what a risk this poses to our Navy. And uh, I think that the, I know the senior leadership, whether it's me or the CNO or the under or the fleet commanders or whoever, know how serious this is and it has our undivided attention. So, anyway, once again, I want to thank y'all very much for welcoming me, old surface guy, back, back into the fold. So, Thank you all and have a great conference.